We want to take you to Latham, New York. Officials are giving an update on a limousine crash in the town of Schoharie that killed at least 20 people Saturday. Let's listen in. And Troop G staff, the Schoharie County Sheriff Ron Stevens, and National Transportation Safety Board Chairman Robert Sumwalt. Our thoughts and prayers are with the victims and their families following this horrific tragedy. On October 6, 2018, at approximately 1.55 p.m., Schoharie County Sheriff's Office and New York State Police Patrols responded to a motor vehicle crash at the intersection of State Route 30 and State Route 30A in the town of Schoharie. The investigation at the scene revealed that a 2001 Ford excursion limousine was traveling southwest on State Route 30 and failed to stop at the intersection with State Route 30A. The limousine traveled across the intersection into a parking lot and struck a 2015 Toyota Highlander that was unoccupied and parked. Two pedestrians standing nearby were also struck and killed. In total, 20 victims were killed. All were adults. 18 of the victims were uh, in the limousine, including the driver and uh, the two pedestrians that were struck. At this time, the identities of the victims are not being released pending the autopsy results and notification of the family members. The state police have set a dedicated phone line to assist the family members of the victims in the crash. We encourage them to call 1-877-672-4911 and speak with a member of the state police. I'll repeat that number. That's 1-877-672-4911. In addition to Troop G uniform and BCI members, the Troop G Collision Reconstruction Unit and For Forensic Investigation Unit responded to the scene along with Sch Schoharie County Sheriff's Department members and members of uh, emergency medical services, numerous volunteer um, agencies. I would like to thank our fellow first responders for their assistance during this investigation. The National Transportation Safety Board was also notified and has launched a team to investigate the crash. The scene has been cleared at this time and the victims have been transported to Albany Medical Center where autopsies are now being uh, conducted. The state police investigation is continuing with interviews, evidence processing, and collision reconstruction. Governor Cuomo has directed all state agencies to provide every resource necessary to aid in the investigation and determination of what led to this tragedy. We will answer questions that we can in a moment, but first, I would like to invite NTSB Chairman Sumwalt to say a few words. Thank you very much, First Deputy Super Superintendent Fiore. Uh, I'm Robert Sumwalt, and I'm the chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. Uh, NTSB GO team arrived uh, this morning to, to begin our investigation of this crash in Skohari. York. Uh, before I go any further, I'd certainly like to express our condolences to all of those who have been affected by this tragedy. Our thoughts and prayers go out to them. Uh, the NTSB is an independent federal agency. We're charged by Congress to investigate transportation accidents, determine the probable cause, and issue safety recommendations to prevent the reoccurrence of those crashes. The investigator in charge leading the investigation will be Mr. Pete Katowski. Pete has over three decades of investigative ex experience. But Mr. Katowski is leading a multidisciplinary team with experts in a number of areas, including highway crash reconstruction, survival factors, vehicle factors, including the mechanical condition of the limo, any roadway factors, and the emergency response. Uh, also accompanying 
the GO team are members from the NTSB's Office of Transportation <coughs> Disaster Assistance. They will be helping to coordinate the response for the families of those involved in this tragedy. The NTSB is also working with the New York State Police as they conduct their investigation. We are conducting our separate investigation, but we will be working together. Uh, throughout the next few days, NTSB investigators will work on scene to thoroughly document the scene and to gather what we call the perishable evidence, the information that goes away with the passage of time. Uh, I expect our investigators will be here about five days. Uh, since we're at the very beginning of the investigation, we really don't have uh, any information to report on the actual investigation itself, but we will be keeping you informed through regular updates, either uh, uh, media briefings or through our uh, media sources like Twitter. Uh, it's important to point out that our mission is to point out not only what happened, but why it happened so that we can keep things like this from happening in the future. We will not be determining the cause of the crash while we are on scene. That will come at a later date, uh, nor will we be speculating on any cause of the crash. We certainly want to thank the first responders. I know it's been a very, very trying 25 hours for all involved. And again, our thoughts and prayers go out to those. I'll turn it back over to the first deputy superintendent. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I'll open it to any questions, but uh, please uh, keep in mind, it's very early in the investigation. We have not made notifications to the family members so that we're gonna be very limited on what we can disclose. Mr. Sergeant, I'm sorry. Uh, could you say even what regions anyone is from on this, what car you're from? And also you mentioned that the, the limousine went through. Can you tell through the stop sign? Can you say how you know that? Was it a witness? Or? Well, I'm, I'm not gonna um, discuss at this time um, you know, the uh, where, where the the limousine came from and where it was heading. As I said, we haven't uh, um, notified all the family uh, members yet. So uh, I'm not going to comment on that at this time. So not even general reasons, if, if they're all upstate or anything like that? I, I, you know, it's early on in the investigation. I really can't. And also the point about the limousine going through, how do you know that? Is that a witness? Or some other? Well, there were witnesses at the scene, but ju just from the, um, uh, you know the evidence discovered at, at, at the crash. It, it it was apparent that this was uh, the direction of travel and and uh, what happened. Where was the limousine coming from, and where was it going? Yeah, I can't comment on that right now. Did, did everyone inside the limousine die, including the driver? Everyone inside the limousine was killed. Was the limousine over capacity, or do you know, or was it fit for the number of people that were actually in it? I I, I can't discuss that at this do you point. Sense of what killed them was a blunt force trauma. I'm, I'm not going to get into that. Was there as anybody well. involved in the accident that survived, was just injured, survived the accident? When, when you say involved in the accident, what do you mean? Like, were there any other bystanders that were in, like, hit or involved in the accident? I can't comment on that. Are I'm, you going to do sure. toxicology on the driver? We'll do a thorough investigation, uh, including an autopsy of, uh, of uh, all the victims and the driver. Do you know if they were speeding, if their limo was speeding? Like, Don't know that at this time. Is there any brakes were working? Again, that's part of the investigation. What are the laws pertaining limo drivers? Do they have to have any kind of special licensing or, or do passengers have to wear seat belts inside limo? What are the laws pertaining to that? The, uh, the front seat passengers and the driver would be required to wear a seat belt. Uh, the passengers in the back would not. How about when it comes to the limo drivers generally? Do they have to have any sort of special training the, or licensing? There are um, specific designations. Uh, but that's also part of the investigation as to uh, what was required for this particular vehicle. First deputy, there were uh, two bystanders, is that correct? Who lost their lives and injured in the There were two pedestrians that were struck. Were they walking along the area, or were they going? That's to still them? that's still uh, um, under investigation. They were not in the in the uh, limousine. Is there any information about the record of the driver? 
Excuse me. Is there any information about the record, the driving record of the driver? Again, that's part of the investigation. Can you identify the company that was operating? Uh, not at this time. So, just to be clear, those two pedestrians were among the 20 people that were killed, correct? Correct. Was I, it? Again, with the seat belt. I'm sorry. Again, with the seat belt. Were, was everybody? Do you know if everybody in the limo was wearing a seat belt? We don't know that at this time. Do you, do you have any idea if? You know, anybody at all had a seatbelt on? That is unknown. What was the type of vehicle was it? Um, it was a 2001 Ford Excursion uh, limousine. License in New York? Yes. Yes. Can you just give a word about the magnitude of this crash? I mean, 20 people killed here. From your experience, just a word about the magnitude of this. I'd rather not comment on that. Can you recall a deadlier incident in this area or New York State? I, again, I, I'm, uh, I, I wouldn't comment on that. This is the third incident that we know of in the last five years that has involved limousines. Can you talk about maybe what you would like to see done in the future to keep people safe in Skyline? That'd be fun to answer some of that if you like. Uh, Chairman, someone. Well, thank you. Uh, the NTSB is very concerned about about safety on our roadways, and uh, we are here. The fact that the NTSB is here indicates that we're very concerned about this. Um, you asked about the magnitude of this. 20 fatalities is just horrific. I've been on the board for, for 12 years, and uh, this is one of the biggest losses of life, loss of lives that we've seen uh, in a long, long time. Colgan Air up at uh, Buffalo killed 40 people. 50 people, but that this is the most deadly transportation accident in this country since February of 2009. Mr. Fury, uh, do you have an estimate of the speed of the traveling? And do you believe it was um, in compliance with the regulations at the area? Uh, we do not have an estimate at this time. That's part of the investigation. Is there any indication that weather might have been involved, say, fog, weather, anything like that? Uh, again, that, that will uh, all be part of the collision reconstruction. Did anyone pronounce dead on the scene, or did anyone get taken by med flight? I believe there was one victim that was uh, transported to Albany Med uh, with a medevac. Last and question. The first superintendent said, "Did the um, when the that intersection? Have you found through your records that there's been a lot of accidents there, an unusual number of accidents?" I I can't speak to that um, either. You know, it's a T intersection. Uh, with a with a 50 mile an hour speed, I can't speak to that at this time. Can I just ask the NTSB one more question? What are you, what, what are you guys looking at to, that you might think that needs to be changed around that area to prevent uh, other accidents like this happening? Because people in the area said that this is quite common. So, the, so the question is, what specifically would the NTSB be looking at to help prevent accidents or crashes like this in the future? Um, we, we, at this point in time, we look at everything. We look at the vehicle factors. We look at the roadway. We look at survival factors. We look at the, at the condition of the drivers, the licensing of the drivers. We look at the operator itself, the company. We look at everything. We, pro, we, we cast a very broad net to see what's out there. And then in our analysis phase is where we start winnowing it down. Uh, but we do, uh, typically, uh, we do, uh, conduct very thorough investigations, and we uh, come out with recommendations designed to prevent these things in the future. That's okay, why, that is why we are here. I'm sorry, she called for the last, that's the last question. She called Thank the last question. Thank you all for coming. I have a question for Harry County. Sure. You want to ask it to him? Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate it. All right, you were just watching officials in Latham, New York, give an update on a deadly limo crash on Saturday that killed 20 people. Uh, no names have been released yet pending uh, notification of next of kin. Autopsies are being conducted. We're going to. Hello, everyone. So thank you so much for being here. <clears throat> um, I wanted to start with that press conference because that was one of the first um, instances that information was relayed regarding this accident. I, I grew up about 30 minutes from where this happened. And while I didn't know anything, anyone personally in this accident, I have family and friends who were close to many of the victims. Many of them um, graduated from schools very close to where I graduated. And this trial has been a long time coming. 
So what I did was um, we're going to talk about the crash itself. Then I'm going to talk about what the NTSB had found based on their investigation. Um, I'm going to talk about the victims. So all 20 of them, because again, they are they are what we need to remember. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about quickly is the day one, <clears throat> excuse me, of the trial, which was today, and jury selection began. Um, one thing to know about um, this area, it is it is not a very big area. It is. Uh, oh, hang on a second. Sorry about that. Ah, hold on. Yikes. Okay. Um. The area is not very big at all, and population-wise, it's small. So what I did, um, and I'm hoping this works out, where I made a um, a PowerPoint presentation instead of having all of my different videos, and I'm hoping that it helps my computer run a little bit more smoothly. Um, it also helps me keep everything organized. So um, hopefully this is this will work well. Um, so this is the area that the accident happened. Um, this is where two main um, county high or state highways um, intersect. Um, you have Route 30 and Route 30A, and this part is Route 30, where you see um, this car here, and this is Route 30A, which goes, um, the actual town of Skihari is going to be more south of where this building is, and then um, the accident actually happened. They they went through the stop sign. Um, and you can see in this area where the trees are, that is where it ended up. And um, we'll talk about that as we go through. Um, yes, this happened in 2018, October 6th, to be exact. It was a Saturday. And um, I remember... I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday. A friend of mine had sent me a message and said, oh my gosh, did you hear about the accident? And I was like, no. And we find out that 20 people lost their lives in an instant. You know, for a small town is pretty catastrophic. So this, um, just to kind of give you a general sense of what the area looked like, um, very rural, very country. Um, actually I'm going to really quick. One thing I didn't do is look up the population. I know it's not very big. Yes. So the actual village of Skahari, it's a village is 948 people as of 2021. So it is a very small town, and again, not a lot of resources. And what we see in a lot of these cases that we talk about, especially looking at the Idaho case or um, you know some of these bigger things that happen in small towns, they can't handle it. Um, so they call in the state police, they call in the FBI. In this case, the NTSB. So um, just a lot of different things, you know, went into this. Yeah, tiny. Um, the town I grew up in, I think, was about 1,200. It may be a little bit higher now, but again, we are, we're in upstate New York. So when you think of New York, a lot of people think of the city, but there's a bunch of us that live outside the city. And a lot of us upstate live in little tiny towns, or in this case, a village 
where there's not a lot of people. And so everybody pretty much knows everybody if you were the same age range. So the next thing, oh, wait a minute. That's not the right slide. Give me one moment. What is... Hmm. All right. Hold on one moment. I'm not sure what exactly is going on because I thought I had another video. Uh, oh, boy. How do I? Oh, that is my first slide. Okay. All right. One moment. Okay, so that must have been my video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to instead share this article. And this article is, um, again, shortly after the crash. This was the date on this is, so this goes along with that CBS News um, press conference. So this was... Um, went along with um, that Sunday, which was October 7th. Um, so police say Sunday, 20 people were killed Saturday in upstate New York when a limousine failed to stop at an intersection and slammed into an SUV in the town of Schoharie, about 25, 25 miles west of Albany, which is our state capital. At a pre press conference Sunday afternoon, authorities said all 20 victims were adults. 18 of those killed were in the limousine and two victims were bystanders. State police said the crash occurred just before 2 p.m. Saturday when the limousine, a 2001 Ford excursion, crossed the intersection of State Route 30 and State Route 30A traveling at about 50 miles per hour. The limo struck an unoccupied Toyota Highlander in a parking lot of a local country store, which then hit and killed the two bystanders. Investigators from the NTSB were on hand to assist in the investigation. Chairman Robert Sumwalt said the crash was, quote, the most deadly transportation accident in this country since February 2009, when a plane crashed into a house outside Buffalo, New York, killing 49 people. Sumwalt said he expected the NTSB's investigation to take about five days. Amy Dunlop Johnson said three members of her family, her cousins Richie and Axel Steenberg, and cousin-in-law Amy Steenberg, were in the limousine and died in the crash. Local news outlets initially reported the limousine was carrying a wedding party, but Dunlop Johnson said the limo was transporting the group between wineries in the area, which is a popular fall tourist destination. And this is the accident site. Let me see if I can, oh yeah, I can make it a little bit um, smaller. So this is, you can see here is the limousine. It may be hard um, to see, but if you look at your bottom left, you can see the white through the, like sh the shrubs and um, the front of the limousine is in the area on the towards the right side um so that is the final resting place the limo crashed into bystanders at the apple barrel country store and cafe in a facebook post saturday the store wrote quote there was a horrific accident in front of our business today in another post sunday the store said it was open for business and could use your hugs New York Governor Andrew Cuomo said in a statement he had directed state agencies to provide every resource necessary to aid in this investigation and determine what led to this tragedy. I join all New Yorkers in mourning these deaths and share in the unspeakable sorrow experienced by their families and loved ones during this extremely difficult time. At least six ambulances and two helicopters responded to the crash. The names of the victims were being withheld pending notification of next of kin and the completion of autopsies. So, 
so next we're going to go into the NTSB report that goes into what actually happened, um, the investigation that they did. And with this, there was a lot of rumor, a lot of, you know, assumptions, and I'm not going to relay them here because, again, I just want to give the facts because um, with this trial, the one thing that's a little disappointing is that it is not live streamed. There is audio that um, reporters can listen to in a, in a jury or um, like a media pool room, like an outside room. They're not allowed in the actual courtroom. And what I've read by local outlets is that the audio is grainy and not very clear. So hopefully, um, you know, there's somebody that was able to get in there to give a report because, like I said, this is a long time coming and um, some crazy stuff went on with how this all ended up the way it is. So NTSB report details terrifying final minutes for passengers in Skihari limo crash. Widow of the chauffeur said he worried about the condition of the stretch style, stretch style SUV. And this was August 27th, 2020. So about just about two years after this accident happened. And here is a photo of the limousine after it was taken out of the um i guess the the shrubs or the you know the overgrowth um pretty pretty awful um so it says a trove of documents from the federal investigation of the October 6, 2018 limousine crash that killed 20 people offers a glimpse into the final horrifying moments inside the doomed vehicle and the chauffeur's ongoing worries about its safety. And one thing I will say is that when this first occurred, initially, everyone was speculating that the driver was under the influence. The driver was drunk or he was drinking or, you know, he wasn't paying attention. He was on his cell phone. And none of that was true. None of it. And that's why I feel, you know, especially with listening to other creators who report true crime, but allow people to speculate and just assume things is, is not responsible. Because that's how rumors start. And one thing I say is one rumor, or one rumor can destroy someone's life. Even, even if it's not true, it can destroy their life. And that's why I feel, you know, we want to be facts only. We can think about things in our head. Um, but you always want to, you know, wait until the facts come out. Um, yeah. So... Again, thank you for those of you who are here hanging out. Um, I know it's not as exciting as our friend Betty, but this is really important to me because it does hit so close to home. The National Transportation Safety Board released the documents Wednesday, just hours before the operator of the company that owned the limousine was scheduled to resume plea bargain no negotiations in the local criminal case. And as we know, a judge denied his request for a plea, plea bargain, and hence that is why he's on trial now. <coughs> the documents arrived ahead of the NTSB's expected vote next month on the finding of a nearly two-year investigation into the cause of the crash and what can be done to prevent similar disasters in the future. It is clear from the documents that the limousine rented from Prestige Limousine in Wilton was experiencing mechanical problems that drew both the concern of the driver, Scott Lisanikia, 
and the passengers, one of whom sent text messages to a friend describing the vehicle's flaws as it rolled through the countryside. The information was re released hours before a lawyer for the operator of the limo company, Naman Hussein, resumed plea bargain negotiations in Schoharie County Court. The session ended with no resolution. Hussein's attorney, Lee Kinlan, D.A. Susan Mallory and Judge George R. Bartlett III expect to meet again on September 23rd. Hussein, age 30, is charged with criminally negligent homicide and second degree manslaughter. The latter count could send him to prison for 15 years, but lawyers for the families of the crash victims say they've been told Hussein could be spared prison time as part of the plea deal. <clears throat> And the report provides a nearly, a nearly minute by minute reconstruction of the doomed limo's final trip, including eyewitness accounts of the driver's actions in the minutes before the 2001 stretch Ford excursion, which was carrying a group of friends and family to a birthday party at the Oma Gang Brewery in Cooperstown crashed. The NTSB details how after the State Department of Transportation had slapped Hussein with multiple violations and fines for operating an illegal lim limo business, it suspended the registrations of his four limos, including the excursion on September 17th, 2018, less than three weeks before the crash. So that hits really hard because they knew that their limousines should not be on the road and yet they still allowed them to be on the road and this happened. However, the NTSB revealed, revealed for the first time Hussein paid a, paid a nominal $500 penalty to the state two days later and the registrations were reinstated. Well, I guess that's how much a life is worth these days. Um, $500. The NTSB report also describes the condition of the inside of the vehicle as it carried its passengers from Amsterdam into Schoharie County. The vehicle that was nearly 20 years old and had safety and mechanical issues that had been uncovered in multiple DOT inspections in the months leading up to the crash. Each time, the DOT had ordered the excursion off the road, but Hussein kept renting it out while claiming he was planning to sell it. The limo sounds like it's going to explode. Erin McGowan, one of the passengers, texted her friend Melissa Healy at about 1.15 p.m. shortly after the limo left Amsterdam. It's a junker, literally. Healy, of Fultonville, had backed out of the trip because she wasn't feeling well. <clears throat> holes in the ceiling McGowan texted back minutes later OMG you should have came McGowan then texted Healy a photo of her husband Shane sitting in his seat with his middle finger in the air the couple married just that June was one of the two newlywed couples on the ride the motor is making everyone deaf McGowan texted Healy at 1.28 p.m adding five crying emojis. When we get to the brewery, we will all be deaf, McGowan texted at 1.37 p.m., just 18 minutes before the crash. That was the last text I received from Aaron, Healy told the state police investigator the day after the tragedy. The limo took the throughway west after leaving Amsterdam and then took exit 28 toward Route 30A to Sloansville before heading onto Route 7. As the 53-year-old limo driver was turning off Route 7 onto Route 30, one witness said that Lysinichia appeared, quote, confused and, quote, frazzled before pulling over to the side of the road. Lysinichia turned on the limo's flashers, another witness observed. When he eventually pulled back onto Route 30, he not only kept the flashers on, but the limo's reverse lights were on with the backup alarm sounding, the NTSB documents say. Just two minutes later, 
as the limo made its final descent down a steep section of Route 30 that eventually intersects with Route 30A near the Apple Barrel Country Store, another witness whose car was stopped at the intersection said she heard a loud noise coming down the hill. She describes the noise, I'm sorry, she described the noise as being like a jet plane. The limousine swerved into the oncoming lane, proceeded through the intersection, and crashed. The witnesses did not hear any braking or see brake lights on the limousine. State, poli state police have blamed catastrophic brake failure for the crash, alleging Hussein, the limo company operator, did not properly maintain the vehicle. His lawyer said he paid for brake repairs and other upkeep. The NTSB notes in its report that due to the ongoing criminal case against Hussein, state police would not allow the NTSB to examine the excursion's brake parts to understand how the brakes may have failed descending Route 30. However, the NTSB said its examination of the route that the excursion took and the dynamics of the crash indicate a potential loss of functional brake capacity as the vehicle descended the final segment of New York 30. The NDSB also did simulation tests that showed that if the limo had properly had a properly working brake system, the 13,565 pound limo would have had sufficient braking capacity to stop safely at the stop sign at the intersection of Route 30 and Route 30A. As a part of its investigation, the NTSB conducted an extensive interview six days after the crash with Kim Lisinichia, Scott Lisinichia's wife, who told investigators that her husband often complained to Hussein about the conditions of, I'm sorry, about the condition of the excursion. I remember hearing him say, and like pretty much practically yelling, like, I'm not driving this limo. You have to get this limo fixed. I'm not going to drive that today. And then Nauman, I guess, would go get it fixed or something. And, you know, Scott trusted that and ended up, you know, driving it. She said that on the morning of the crash, her husband, who also worked as a driver for Uber, left their home in Queensbury at 10 a.m. to drive to Saratoga Springs Warehouse parking lot, where Hussein kept several limousines, including the excursion and two stretch Lincoln town cars. She said her husband called her later that morning to say that he had to switch the limo out, although the NTSB has not been able to determine what led to that decision and if he had originally been told to use a different limo than the excursion. Did he tell you what the problem he was having with that limo was? An investigator asked. No, she replied. We said we love you, and that was the last I heard from him. Around 1.55 p.m., the excursion raced through the intersection of Route 30 and Route 30A, killing two ped pedestrians in the parking lot before slamming into a ditch. All but two of the passengers died on impact, and the others died soon after in what remains the nation's deadliest transportation disaster in a decade. The woman who was stopped at the intersection of Route 30 and Route 30A when the limo rocketed by thought she and her daughter who was also in the car, were going to be victims too. It sounded like a jet engine. That's how loud it was, Hollywood of Esperance told state police. Wood said the limo was at full speed as it came up behind her Jeep Patriot. I thought it was going to crash into me and I froze. It didn't even dawn on me to get out of the way. I yelled for my daughter to hold on. A state police report revealed that Lysinichia, who swerved out of the way of the Jeep at the last minute, had desperately tried to engage the brakes as the limo rolled down Route 30. He applied so much force that the tread on the bottom of his loafers made a permanent impression on the brake pedal. That I, I did not know that until I just read that. Wood told police that after the limo hit an SUV, that slammed and killed the two pedestrians. The excursion, quote, flew right into the trees and a ditch next to the Apple Barrel parking lot. The back end came up about 45 degrees and then slammed down. 
Wood and her daughter got out of the Jeep and ran toward the scene, and Wood's daughter, Evangeline Peck, called 911. I walked over towards the apple barrel and saw two deceased men. After calling 911, Peck ran to the top of the bank of the ditch where the limo had landed to see if anyone needed help. I couldn't see or hear anything or anyone, she said. In the documents, the NTSB notes that Lysinichia had traces of marijuana in his system and that he also took medication for bipolar disorder. It makes no final conclusion, but notes drivers who use marijuana can be charged with driving under the influence of a drug. The documents also include 71 pages of correspondence between the NTSB, District Attorney Mallory, Hussein's lawyer Kinlan, and Judge Bartlett. In the letters, many of which date from early 2019, a lawyer for the NTSB takes issue with Mallory over the agency's access to the limousine. The agency alleged Mallory was unwilling to let them inspect the limo, which was in the custody of the state police. The NTSB suggested Mallory showed them a, quote, lack of candor when they pressed for access, but Mallory contended the criminal probe took precedence over the federal agency's safety investigation. Mallory wrote that the NTSB's own policies dictated that criminal investigations were the priority. An agreement was eventually reached that led the NTSB, let the NTSB inspect the limo, but in letters sent before the agreement was made, the agency's lawyers argued the passage of time her evidence examination for its case. So that is what the was found with the NTSB. And I do have a photo that I want to, um, oops, wrong thing. Um, uh, this is a photo that the NTSB had released in connection with the accident. And this gives a visual of what happened. So in the one photo we saw, the back of the scene was somewhat intact. However, the front was completely impacted. Um, so here it says steering wheel displaced aft and upwards. So here's the steering wheel ended up above. Deformation and intrusion. Um, and again, in the back, no intrusion, survivable, survivable space. The driver's seat had been displaced. Left front wheel was displaced approximately 49.2 inches. Crush distance Crush distance at front was roughly 60 inches. Crush distance at driver's seat, roughly 20 inches. And then it also shows a an aerial view where the majority of the limousine would have been survivable. Um, however, because of the force of impact, they didn't. So that I found was um, really interesting. I had never seen this photo either, but it gives a good perspective as to where the brunt of the impact was. And, you know, it it's just um, horrific that no one survived. So next we're going to get into the victims which again, um, the victims I feel are the most important to think about here. And um, this was from the Democrat and Chronicle. I have never heard of this. However, um, looking at different articles that they had about their survivors, I feel like this one was the most thorough and um, respectful. Some of the art, the other articles that I saw talking about the victims had photos of the crash, which I thought was kind of um, distasteful. 
Um, but this one had, had none of that, at least what I saw. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to see these pictures um, bigger, but these are photos of the victims. Um, and <clears throat> as I said at the beginning of this live, many of them are from where I grew up. Um, they were much younger than I am, so I didn't know them personally, but a lot of my family and friends did. Um, when you think about, again, if you're coming in, thank you to those of you who have joined me. Um, I know it's not my usual, my usual live, but this is important to me. And the trial, uh, day one of the trial started today with jury selection. And um, so it's been a long time coming. Um, and I just forgot, I was going to say, oh, so for those of you just coming in, um, the town of Schoharie is less than 1000 people as of 2021. So a lot of the towns and villages are, are small. The town I grew up in was about 1200. Um, we had, we had one street light. Um, now we have two. So it's, you know, it's, it's very small. I think the, the length of the town I grew up in, like if you go from one side of the town to the other is probably only about a mile. Like that's how, how long our main, our main street is. Um, granted, you know, you have like the outside, um, places where people live, but you know, just very, very small. So when you think of 20 people losing their lives in, in an instant, the shock waves are, are felt all over. So, um, I'll just kind of do a little recap here. Saturday's limousine crash in Schoharie. So again, this was October 6th, 2018, about 40 miles west of Albany, claimed the lives of 17 passengers, the driver, and two pedestrians. It was the deadliest transport accident in the United States since February 2009 when a when Colgan Air Flight 3407 crashed near Buffalo and that we had heard earlier killed 49 souls. Lost in the tragedy were sisters, brothers, and married couples. There was a teacher, a veteran, and even a competitive dodgeball player. One passenger died on his birthday, while another was celebrating her forthcoming birthday. Here is some of what we know of those who died in the crash. I'm going to zoom out just a little. So this is Amanda Hulse and Patrick Cushing. Hulse was 26 and she was a waitress and Cushing was 31 and he worked in the New York State Senate. Actually, I'm going to leave them up there for a minute longer. Amanda Hulse, 26, and her boyfriend, Pas Patrick Cushing, 31, were dating for more than two years and had recently moved to Troy, which has, quote, more to do. She was very talented. She was a great artist. There were so many, so they were so happy together, her and Patrick. They had a nice apartment. They had two cats. Hulse worked as a waitress in nearby Waterville just across the Hudson River from Troy, according to her sister, Karina. Cushing grew up in Amsterdam, Montgomery County, and worked as a staffer for the State Senate's Technology Services Unit. He was a competitive dodgeball dodge player representing Team USA at the Dodgeball World Cup tournaments in England and at Madison Square Garden in Manhattan, according to his family. Patrick could walk into a crowded room and walk out later with three new friendships, not acquaintances, friendships, a special soul in every way. Yes. Thank you, Rebel. Oh, local to you too. Are you, so you're upstate, I would assume. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you heard me, but I, I grew up 
Um, my hometown is about 30 miles from here. So um, <clears throat> definitely very close. Next, we have Aaron and Shane McGowan. Aaron and Shane McGowan, both 30, had only been married five months when they joined friends in the limousine headed for a brewery in Cooperstown. Aaron, 34, scheduled appointments at a pediatrician's office. Shane worked for Miracle Ear. They lived in nearby Amsterdam. They were celebrating their friend's birthday. They didn't get to go where they were going, said Aaron's grandmother, Lestra Vertucci. And here are they in their wedding in 2018. So they had been married, yeah, not very long at all. And um, I know these two, um, Aaron and Shane, are, are two of those who were very close to one of my family members. Um, they were very much affected by their passing, and um, it's still her to this day. Brian Hall, Brian, I think it's Hoff, Brian Hoff and James Schnur. So these two individuals were actually the bystanders who um, were, were killed from the impact of the, the car that was hit. Um, James Schnur, 70, was one of the 20 who lost their lives. Um, he lived in Kerhoxen, Ulster County, which I believe Ulster County is towards New York City. Like, it's along I-87 going towards New York City. Um, his son-in-law, Brian Ho, was also killed as a pedestrian. And here is a picture of Brian. So Brian and his father-in-law, James Schnur, 70, were in the parking lot of the Apple, Berry, Apple Barrel Country Store when they were fatally struck by the vehicle on Saturday. Brian, 46, received his Ph.D. in Geological Sciences from the University of Rochester in December 2010 and was an associate professor at SUNY Oswego. He's just a very warm-hearted, wonderful person. He's a great father, a great son. He loved teaching. He loved working with students. He left behind a wife, Jackie, and an eight-year-old son. He resided in he resided in Kerhonkson, Ulster County. And again, thank you everyone for being here. Um, Avoca, interesting. I don't know if I've never heard of Avoca, but um, I'm definitely going to look that up. Um, my, my, some of my family came from, um, Hudson Falls and, um, that was one side of the family. The other side of the family, um, came from Italy and they, they, um, settled in the town where I grew up, which I will not name because we know how that goes. Um, next is Amy and Axel Steenberg. So here is a picture of them with their puppy. Um, they were both 29 and out celebrating Amy's upcoming 30th birthday. A 2011 graduate of SUNY Plattsburgh, Amy worked as a nurse. Axel was employed at Global Foundries. And Amy, you now this is where it got really, really heartbreaking. Amy was one of four sisters killed in the crash. So one family lost four of their daughters or granddaughters or nieces. Yes. Oh, Beth, that's by Buffalo, right? Is that out west or by Rochester, maybe? Is it west? I'm more north. I'm like north upstate. Um, 
Axel and Amy Steenberg, 29, married in June. So again, they had only been married about four months, give or take. The group that gathered Saturday was traveling to Brewery Omagang in Cooperstown to celebrate Amy's 30th birthday, which would have been October 10th. And for those of you coming in again, this occurred on October 6th, 2018. And today was, was day one of the trial where jury selection started. A 2011 graduate of SUNY Plattsburgh, Amy worked as a nurse. Axel Steenberg, 29, was employed at Global Foundries, a company that designs semiconductors. He graduated from Excelsior College with degrees in electrical engineering and nanotechnology. Amy Steenberg's three sisters were also killed in the limousine crash, as was Axel Steenberg's brother and his wife. Days before the tragedy, Amy Steenberg wrote on her Facebook page, I just wanted to say, Axel Steenberg, I love you more than words, words can say. You are such an amazing man and entertain all my crazy ideas. Allison King. And these are the four sisters that all lost their lives that day. Hey, Yanni, welcome. Um, so again, Allison King is the far left. Abby Jackson, Amy Steenberg, Mary Dyson. They were all sisters. Allison King, 31, was one of the four sisters traveling in the limousine. In a Facebook posting, SUNY Plattsburgh official said Monday that she was one of four alumni killed in the crash. Allison was an undergraduate student from 2005 until earning her degree in speech communications in 2010. This is shocking and tragic. We grieve with their surviving family members and all who knew them. Mary and Rob Dyson. Mary, 33, was also one of the four sisters in the limousine. She joined the celebration with her husband, Rob. The couple lived in Watertown. Mary, an Army veteran, was the vice president of Upstate Construction Services in Watertown. An engineer, she previously worked for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Mary was also a coach at the physical fitness operation in Watertown Star Spangled CrossFit. It is with heavy hearts that we are sad to announce the Star Spangled family has lost one of our beloved coaches, Mary Dyson and her husband, Rob. One person commented on the Facebook page, Mary was an amazing coach, never judged a person's ability and was always willing to explain things. She and her husband, Rob, 34, met while attending Clarkson University. They graduated in 2007. Rob Dyson worked at Stebbins Engineering and Manufacturing Company, which specializes in corrosion-resistant linings and construction. He was a senior estimator at the company. The couple had a three-year-old son, Isaac, according to a GoFundMe campaign. Abigail and Adam Jackson. The oldest of four sisters together Saturday, Abigail Abby Jackson, 34, taught reading at Wilbur H. Lynch Literacy Academy in the Greater Amsterdam School District. Abigail Jackson and another faculty member led the Sunshine Club, which is a group for teachers to provide support to colleagues who suffered a loss, underwent a serious surgery, or other painful experiences. Adam, 34, was a deputy commissioner at the Montgomery County Board of Elections. He and Abigail had two children, four-year-old Archer and 16-month-old L. Adam and Abby were amazing parents to these girls and taken much too soon. Rich Steenberg. So Axel Steenberg, again, lost his life. He is on the left, so this is Axel here. 
and Rich is on the right. So they were brothers. The older brother of Axel Steenberg, Rich Steenberg, 34, also worked at Global Foundries. He was the father of a 10-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old stepson. His wife, Kimberly, was also intending to join the birthday celebration, but chose not to because she felt ill. Rich, Rich Steenberg was the best man in the June wedding of his brother. Michael Ukaj. The fateful crash that took Michael's life came on his 34th birthday. A Marine Corps veteran, Ukaj was a resident of Kuroga Lake, Fulton County. We love you and miss you, our dear baby boy. You were such an inspiration when you wanted to join the Marine Corps. Thank you for your combat service and for being my son. I love you forever. See you in heaven, baby. And there is a picture of him. Amanda Rivenberg. Amanda, 29, was an employee at Living Resources, an organization focused on providing growth opportunities for people with disabilities since 2011. During her tenure with the organization, she received several promotions, her latest being assistant director of the Day Community Opportunities Program. She will be remembered fondly through her loving spirit, wonderful smile, thoughtful nature, and her genuine commitment to her colleagues and individuals that we serve. Rivenberg graduated from SUNY Plattsburgh in 2011, receiving a bachelor's degree in social work. Rachel Cavosi. Rachel was remembered by her cousin, Alyssa, as a soul that touched so many lives. She gave me so much guidance, and even though she was the younger cousin, I looked up to her and often sought her advice throughout my life. Cavosi, 30, worked as a dental hygienist in Troy. She previously volunteered at a yoga and health center in Massachusetts. Scott Lissanichia, a Lake George resident, Lissanichia, 53, was driving the limousine in Saturday's crash. It hurts me to my core to have to bury my husband, his wife said. I miss him so very much. I love you, Scotty, she wrote, according to the Syracuse.com website. A lawyer for the family said in a statement that Scott was a loving and caring man who never would have knowingly put others in harm's way. The family is that unbeknownst to him, he was provided with a vehicle that was neither roadworthy nor safe for any of its occupants. The family is devastated by the horrific tragedy that occurred in Schoharie, and their prayers go out to all the families that lost loved ones. They are mourning their husband, father, and brother, and they are also grieving for the other innocent souls who lost their lives. Matthew Coons and Savannah Bersis. Matthew Coons, 27, and Savannah Bersis, 23, had been dating for the last two years. When they first started dating, she said with a laugh, oh, um, Matthew's sister Ashley Coons said with a laugh that she was a little protective of her brother, but that the three of them had grown very close in the last couple of years. Savannah and I, we had a rough start. She really adapted into our fitness lifestyles in everything that we did, and she really just took it all on and accepted it. She became like a sister, like a best friend. Jill Richardson Perez, Matthew Coons's mother, said losing her son is still something she's not sure how to process. But knowing Matthew and Savannah aren't without one another gives her some small comfort. I'm glad Savannah and Maddie were together because I cannot imagine Matt surviving without Savannah. They were looking to buy a house, a place with property for the dogs. They had a plan for life. They had a future. I don't want my son gone. I miss him terribly. But that they were together, there's some comfort in that for me. And that is 
all of the those victims that lost their love again, Matthew Coons and Sav Savannah Bersis. Scott Lisiniccia, who was the driver of the limousine. Rachel Cavosi. Amanda Rivenberg. Michael Ukaj. Axel and Rich Deenberg. Abigail and Adam Johnson. I'm sorry, Abigail and Adam Jackson. Mary and Rob Dyson. Allison King, along with her three sisters. Amy Steenberg, who was married to Axel Steenberg. Brian Hoff. James Schnur, Aaron and Shane McGowan, Amanda Hall, and Patrick Cushing. All right, so the last thing I want to talk to you about is the jury selection um, that took place today. Um, again, I am going to be following this case. I probably won't do um, a live like I am now just because I wanted to give a history of what happened and talk about the victims. Um, most likely it'll be a recorded um, video that I give um, updates or maybe like a weekly update. Again, it all depends on how it's reported um, in our local media and um, any information that might come out of it. Um, let me get rid of this. All right, so lawyers ready questions for first potential jurors in Schoharie limo crash trial. Commissioner summons nearly 5% of Schoharie County's population to jury duty as prosecution and Naman Hussein's lawyers seek panel for high profile case. And so again, Schoharie, New York, which is a town in Schoharie County where this occurred, only has, as of 2021, it had 900 and 48 people. The Harry County as a whole has, as of 2021, it had just under 30,000 people. So there's quite a few um, people that can be chosen from um, actual county. And here is the um, owner and operator that is being charged. Um, and again, this was not reported on. However, the this man is the son of someone who also was a owner and operator of this establishment. The father, I don't believe, has returned to the United States. 
um, shortly after this happened, the father went back to his native country. And so now the son is taking, you know, responsibility for what happened. And so this is him here. Um, I'm just going to see what other pictures they have. Um, here is his attorney, Lee Kindlin. Another attorney, Lee Kindlin. That's just a close up. Um, that must be. Doesn't say who's with him, but that's the the person on trial now, Hussein. There he is again. There he is again. All right, so we'll move on. Okay, so lawyers will begin Monday afternoon the questioning of the first group of potential jurors summoned for the trial of prestige limousine company operator Naman Hussein, who faces dozens of charges of manslaughter and criminally negligent homicide in the October 6, 2018 limo crash that left 20 people dead. Jury selection in the high-profile case began at 10.30 a.m., with State Supreme Court Justice Peter Lynch describing the charges Hussein faces and quizzing the first 16 jury candidates about where they lived. The courtroom is filled with nearly 100 potential jurors, the first wave of panelists called to take part in, an, in what is likely the highest profile trial in Schoharie County history. And again, I would agree with that statement because it is not a very big county 30,000 um you know is some cities so very small indeed after a lunch break DA Susan Mallory and Hussein's attorney Lee Kinlan will question the 16 jurors in their efforts to determine if the candidates can be impartial the first group of would-be jurors appear to be dominated by women but reporters are watching the proceedings on a grainy camera feed in a room in the basement of the county courthouse. Audio from the courtroom is not always clear. Hussein's brother, Harris, and his fiance Melissa Bell, are in the room, too. Bell appeared to grow emotional after Lynch read charges that named the 20 people killed in the crash. The jury will be picked from residents of a county that remains ground zero for the country's deadliest transportation disaster in years. Pre-trial publicity in a case that generated national headlines and years of consistent local coverage prompted Hussein's legal team to weigh a request to move the trial to another part of the state, but an application never came. The prosecution and defense are trying to find a panel of people suitable to decide whether Hussein bears criminal responsibility for the crash. Being on the jury will require jurors to serve through at least six weeks of testimony and hear the troubling details of a crash that instantly killed nearly every victim. The Schoharie County Commissioner of Jurors sent jury duty summons to 1,500 residents roughly 5% of the rural county's population. Hussein's attorney, Lee Kinlan, Schoharie County DA, Susan Mallory, and State Supreme Court Justice Peter Lynch are expected to interview up to 90 potential jurors a day until they settle on the panel that will, de that will determine whether Hussein bears criminal responsibility for the crash. The size of the jury pool is a sign of the high-profile impact the case has generated locally. The case has drawn years of news coverage and an unknown number of friends and relatives of the 20 people killed are expected to crowd the modestly sized courtroom throughout the trial. Hussein, 33, is charged with 20 counts each of second degree manslaughter and criminally negligent homicide. The manslaughter charge carries a maximum sentence of 15 years in prison. The trial is getting underway months after state Supreme Court Justice Peter Lynch threw out Hussein's original plea deal, which spared him from prison time. 
and that was something that I remember when they said he was trying to make a plea deal where he wouldn't have to serve any time. I remember feeling the disgust that it would even be entertained after something like this happened. Lynch ruled the deal ran afoul of state law and an appeals court twice rejected Hussein's bid to have the deal restored. The October 6, 2018 crash in a parking lot next to the Apple Barrel Country Store came in the midst of the region's fall tourist season. The limousine was carrying 17 passengers, many from Amsterdam, to a party at the Oma Gang Brewery outside Cooperstown when the brakes failed on a steep section, Route 30, and uh, failed on a steep section of Route 30 in Skahari. The out of control, super stretch Ford Excursion SUV style limousine descended the hill and slammed into the parking lot. Two bystanders were killed, and all of the passengers and the driver died when the limousine slammed into a ditch. The crash remains the USA's deadly highway wreck in over a decade. Okay, this, this article has a lot of typos. Okay, Times Union. The crash remains the USA's most deadly highway wreck in over a decade. Mallory is expected to argue that Hussein neglected important mechanical work on the limousine, sending it out on a road with brakes in such bad repair that they failed and would not engage despite chauffeur Scott Lisinichia's making a making such a frantic effort to stop the vehicle that he left his shoes print on the brake pedal. And again, that is something like I just I imagine that in my head. And he tried everything he could to, to save himself and the rest of his passengers. Like, that just, it's just, I can't, I can't imagine. Hussein's legal team asserts Mavis Discount Tire did not perform brake work that was paid for by Hussein's company. They are also expected to argue that Lysanichia had marijuana in his system. And obviously you can see they're going to, they're going to say, oh, he had drugs in his system. But let me tell you, the fact that he tried to hit those brakes so hard that his shoe left an imprint, imprint on the brake pedal, like to me, like maybe you're impaired. But he knew he he tried everything he could in order to keep that from happening. So I feel like it's a really weak argument, but one that they have to they have to make. And that is it. Yes. Hey, Sinner, what's going on? Um. So yeah, I agree. Um. He he did everything he could to prevent this from happening. And, um, I'm going to be definitely following this, um, for the next six weeks. And, um, I, I may see if, since I'm going to be done with work in about three weeks, um, I might see if I can't take a little road trip to, um, Schoharie County, um, I'm going to have to see if they, if anybody can go in. Um, but maybe I'll just, um, take a road trip and check out the trial in person for a couple days. Um, you know, why not? Um, so thank you again, everybody who, who hung out with me for the long haul. I really appreciate it. I know it's not as interesting as my friend Betty, but she was a little boring today. I've got to say, I did find a few things that I was yelling at her at on my way home. I was like, are you kidding me? And then a caller called in and she made up this. Ugh, it made me so mad. So that's going to be coming in a video. Um, but overall, she was like really calm and kind of boring. Um, so this actually, so I'm not sure you should have gotten a notification, but this was like a last minute, um, 
live. I wasn't going to go live. And then on my way home, I had heard that this was day one of jury selection. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to do a video on this because, you know, this is, this is important to talk about. So I think I scheduled it at like four o'clock. I mean, it was, it was last minute and that's kind of, that's kind of how I roll. Um, tomorrow I will probably be live. Um, I'll review some things with, um, my bestie bougie Betty. And I really think using Google slides was much easier with the videos and other things. Um, so I think I'm going to start using Google Slides to do my presentations from now on, unless I have to read an article. So, um, yeah. So, again, thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate it. And, um, yeah, until next time, have a great day, and I will see you all on the flip side.